So thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here. And I, I wanted to start something, uh, uh, maybe a trend uh, uh, of robot jokes. So a robot rolls into a bar uh, carrying a load of drinks. And the bartender says, uh, Drink, drinks are on him. All right, not so funny. Spins around, and the bartender says, the drinks are on the house. OK, so maybe that's too much. Um, I want to talk about service robotics today. and. Uh, I'm pretty excited about the idea that we can do robots that serve people. And I want to step back a little bit and show you a, an old robot. This is about five years old now. A robot that is actually uh, could get you a beer from the refrigerator and bring it. So this is a kind of service. Um, and is a, when you ask people what they want in a robot, they often tell you, well, I just want a robot to bring me a beer. I mean, to me, this is the pinnacle of laziness, right? My kitchen's not that far from my TV. Um, but uh, you can do that, and, and you can see here, um, what you notice on the one side is that here's a robot actually opening the refrigerator door, reaching in, finding the, the beer that you selected. Um, it's actually got some intelligence. It says, um, if you ask for a Guinness, it'll bring you a Guinness. If you ask for a Bud Light, it says, are you sure you want a Bud Light? Um, and, uh, and then it closes the door, which is something I want to teach my kids to do. And then uh, it navigates through a large building and brings the beer to somebody and, and hands it to them. So that's a cool application, right? That was something that, as I said, we did five years ago. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that's a uh, $400,000 robot, right? Um, and when you calculate that out, that's a very, very expensive bartender, right? And so how do you take robots and do what Dimitri is suggesting, which is get robots down to a cost where people can use them every day? Um, the thing that's hard about robots, and, and Dimitri's right, it's getting easier to build robots, but it still takes a village to build a robot. Right? And what I mean by that is there's a lot of levels of disciplines, engineering disciplines, that are needed just to make a robot. You need mechanical engineers to make it physically work. Um, you need electrical engineers to make it so that it doesn't you know, short out and kill people, so that you manage the batteries, so that you can wire everything up together. And then you need multiple levels of software engineers, from drivers who people who are writing drivers for sensors, people who are uh, writing mid-level software for navigation, getting the robot to move around. And then you need high-level uh, engineers to build the actual application that people interact with. And then you need designers and people who are going to design the human interaction if you actually want to think about it. So when you build a general purpose robot, this becomes difficult. When you build a special purpose robot, it becomes easier, but not easy. One of the things that's making it easier today uh, or three things that are making it easier today, and Dimitri mentioned two of them. One of them is cheap processors, right? Cell phones are driving the cost of processors down. You have a market of billions, and processors, not only the speed of processors, but also the power requirements of processors going down makes processors much more suitable for robots long term. Cheap sensors, uh, PrimeSense, the Kinect uh, from Microsoft, um, is a sensor that really changed the robotics landscape dramatically when it came out about three or four years ago. Um, because all of a sudden, you had a way to see the world in 3D from your robot for $150. Before that, seeing the world in 3D was a $5,000 problem. Right? And so all of a sudden, things get more affordable. But probably the biggest thing that changed is that over the last uh, seven or eight years, something called the robot operating system was developed. And the robot operating system is a collection of robot software that's open source, and anybody can take it and incorporate it in their robot. And that allows you to go after the problems that you want to go after in robotics and leverage the work of others, sort of stand on the shoulders of giants, if you will, to, to build the robot that you want to build. So those are, I think, the uh, you know, three things that are, that are making it easier. Um, but I want to stress that it's still not a trivial problem. It's not like an internet startup where you have two guys in a garage, and they didn't actually need the garage. All they needed was the dining room table, right? In robotics, we need the garage. We need another garage. We need you know, milling machines, and we need or access to capital so that we can have other people mill things for us. We need sophisticated CAD software at the mechanical level, sophisticated board design software at the electrical level and then sophisticated um, compilers and, and software systems at the software level, including the robot operating system. So when, I've been, uh, when I was at Willow Garage uh, before this, we had this debate internally. Should we go into f the factory? With our, should we, you know, we're going to design a next robot after that PR2 that you saw. We're going to de design a next robot, and we want to really put robots out in the world. Should we go into the factory? Should we go into the home? 
right? In the home, you have Roombas. There's like 12 million Roombas in the world now. It's the most prevalent robot in the world. In industrial factories, there's like 2 million industrial arms, usually bolted to the floor. And this question that was asked in the previous session about what's a robot is really relevant because a Roomba and an industrial robot arm are pretty different beasts, and we call them both robots, right? And R2-D2 is yet a different beast, and C-3PO um, or the Aldebaran now are all all completely different things. Um, there's some similarities. They have motors, um, they have sensors, they have some processing, but so does your microwave, um, so does your dishwasher. So what we realized is that it's a false dichotomy to ask, should we be in the factory, should we be in the home? But there's actually a huge space in the middle where you get some of the interesting uh, characteristics of homes, like people sleep there, people eat there, um, but you get them with multiple uh, people doing it at the same place, right? So a hotel is like a home in a lot of ways. It has a kitchen, it has uh, bedrooms, it has beds, um, but it has lots of beds, a lot more beds than you have in your home, typically. And that means that if you put a robot in, a robot could serve 100 rooms, whereas in your home it might serve three bedrooms, right? And therefore, you get economies of scale um, that make sense with robots there. And so when we started uh, Savio just over a year ago, we said, how are we going to make, a, wh what are we going to make a robot do? We decided we would make a robot that could do delivery because that's navigation, that's something we thought we could do well. And we said we're going to do it in the service industry because we can do it uh, over and over and over in the same place and get some value. So we, we came to the conclusion, let's focus, focus, focus. So um, we wanted to take what's cool about robots. I mean, people love Roombas. I don't know the exact percentage, but there's something like half of the Roombas in the world, uh, people give them names. They treat them like pets, right? So you think you bought it as a vacuum, but actually it's your pseudo pet. Um, when I used to have a Roomba, my favorite game was find the Roomba when I came home because it would always end up under the couch or something. Um, on the other side, you have super efficient and productive robots in factories. And one of the big trends today is robots coming out from behind fences. They're behind fences because they're dangerous because they're carrying a welding torch and they move really, really fast. And if you got in between the welding, be between the robot arm and the car, you'd probably get your head knocked off. Those robots are dangerous. We're now seeing a trend toward robots that are either robot arms that are safer to be around people, they call co-robotics, or robots that can simply be around people like this savvy one that we've designed. Um, and so I want to talk about that robot. Um, can I get some water maybe? Um, this is the first robot delivery system for hotels. And we're offering it as a managed, oh, there we go, perfect. We're offering it as a managed service. Um, and the idea is that this robot will, um, will basically bring things from one point um, and bring it to another place. I'll try to let you hear what it's saying. Um, so it opens up its lid and brings me my water. Now, it, I need to say, it doesn't know that I wanted water, right? I asked for water, a person put the water in and said, go to, from wherever it was behind the counter to come here. So what this robot's core competence is, is navigation. What that means is it can drive from point A to point B without hitting anything, without hitting anybody, without getting lost, and in a reasonably graceful way that's okay to be around people, in a way that's safe. So it, you know, it's safe, it has a bumper, if I bump the bumper, it, sort of backs up, and more importantly, if it should never hit the bumper unless, like I hit it when it stopped. It should never bump the bumper, but that's a backup. Um, I have a simple tablet uh, interface here. I say, um, remove my items. Uh, I've got my items, so I say all set. And then it asks me to rate it. Um, this is actually something that we added. This robot's in the hotel industry, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we added this uh, rating system because people were asking, how can I spend more time with the robot? So we added a little rating system. If you give it five stars, it makes a very happy dance, um, makes a little happy whistle noise, and then uh, heads back to its dock, wherever that is. In a hotel, the robot would have come from the front desk all the way uh, up through the elevator, calls the elevator, rides up to my room. Um, and let me show you that, actually. Um, if you can play the video, Peter. Um, it, in a hotel, uh, this is the scenario. I'll, I'll take you through it. Uh, if you play the video, please. Yeah. Um, so somebody at the front desk of the hotel loads the robot, puts whatever it is that's going to go in there inside. Uh, petting is not required. In fact, the robot doesn't detect that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but everybody does it. I don't know why. Um, then the robot navigates its way from the front desk to the elevator bay, 
um, parks itself outside of the elevator and calls the elevator. And then when the elevator arrives, it goes inside. When it gets to its floor, the robot gets off the elevator. Um, this is the first robot that I know of that rides elevators with people all the time, completely autonomously. Um, when it gets to the door, it aligns itself in front of the door and then calls the room. Uh, the person answers the phone, hears that their delivery has arrived, opens the door, and at the time they open the door, the robot detects that the door has been opened, and now it opens its lid. So you can put food in it, you can put things that are, you don't, wouldn't want tampered with inside, because it won't unlock its lid until it gets to the door. Um, finally, you give it the rating we talked about, um, and it uh, heads back to, uh, heads back to the, its dock. We call this the shimmy. It's a little dance that you can do with a very simple robot. Um, one of the things that we focused on here was building the simplest, lowest cost robot we could because we didn't want to spend a lot of time um, in this environment. Uh, we didn't want to spend a lot of energy building functions in that we don't need. We wanted to do, um, you know, keep it simple and, and build the minimum viable product because, again, we're, we're a one-year-old startup at this point. Um, I just want to show you, if you click on the the girl, and there's a video behind that. Um, one of the things that we totally underestimated when we built this uh, system was how, oops, go back, please, um, was how much this robot delights people, right? Um, kids, you know, I, I, we, we've been following the robot around during tests, and we, and we hear the robot go to the door, and we'll be out of sight, but we'll hear the kid open the door and say, Mom, oh my God, oh my God, there's a robot, oh my God, Mom, there's a robot. And it goes on for like three minutes until the robot's, there go, Mom, there goes the robot. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting, and, and um, it's not just kids. I had a, uh, you know, a, an, uh, an older guy open the door, and, he, and I, hear, I just hear down the hall, holy shit, like that. Um, it's pretty exciting. Um, and the hotel realizes this. Uh, this is in the loft in Cupertino, and, and they actually put a, a little sign in the lobby on the floor that says this is where the robot parks and um, offering or inviting everybody to snap a selfie with the robot, and it's conveniently right in front of their... Um, their logo so that everybody snaps selfies with their logo in the background. Um, so I want to I say one more thing, um, which is sort of motivating for this. So this is a robot that we've built that's in its first um, test deployment, and we're going into our second hotel and third hotel in the next couple months. Um, but I want to say something about why robotics, because a lot of questions come up about, are robots good, are robots bad, are robots going to be our overlords? I hate that phrase. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of these things come from the Terminator. But I want to tell you about a project called Robots for Humanity. And if you can go ahead and play this video. Um, this is a guy named Henry Evans who lives here in, in the Bay Area. And Henry was a CFO of a Silicon Valley company um, when he had a brainstem stroke. And he came out of the hospital mute and quadriplegic. So imagine that. He can't speak. He can't move. All he can do is hear, feel, see, and think. He, he um, did a TED Talk where he talks about how he routinely kicks my butt at words with friends, um, which is true. He's pretty good at it. Um, he con communicates using head motion and basically controlling a mouse. And he saw this CNN clip and said, you know what, that PR2 robot could be my external body. Um, and this was life-changing for Henry because suddenly he's got a robot that can be his body. It was also life-changing for me because suddenly I can see really clearly the p value potential of robots. And the first thing Henry did with the robot was not pick something up or play chess or something. He turned the robot on himself, he moved the hand right in front of his nose, and he scratched his itch, right? And it was the most touching moment uh, I can imagine because suddenly this person who hadn't been able to scratch his own itch for 10 years was able to do that. He also went on to shave himself, um, and, and there's a, this project continues. It's run... Uh, it was sponsored out of Little Garage, and, and now it's um, actually government-sponsored. Um, and uh, Henry works on it uh, out of his house, and Georgia Tech, Charlie Kemp's lab there works on it as well. Um, uh, and they're continuing to work on, on advances in the robot. But this is just you know, some examples. The, the robot um, going to a drawer, Henry's controlling it. He can see the, the, what's going on in front of him in 3D. He can use the robot to get something out of a drawer. And the way he uses that is he drives it across his house, opens a drawer, gets a towel, and comes and wipes his face. Because you know, it's sort of an uncomfortable social interaction when you have somebody who can't control drooling. It's not his fault, right? He, he knows he's drooling. He wants to just wipe it up, and he doesn't have to ask for help every single time. Here he was giving out um, candy to trick-or-treaters on Halloween. Um, this is getting the towel out, uh, again, under his remote control. And so I think that, you know, when we think about why, 
when I think about why we're building robots, why we're trying to drive the cost of robotics down, we keep as kind of a beacon in our mind that there's this notion that robots really can help humanity. We can really augment the abilities that we don't necessarily have anymore. So all of us over time are going to lose abilities as we get older. And if the robots can, can help fill in some of those gaps, it can make our lives better. And that's kind of what drives me and, and a lot of my team. So with that, let me just conclude that I think uh, service robots are coming very soon. This robot is, as I say, in hotels and, and over the next couple of years is going to be in lots of hotels. It's going to be a robot that you're going to be able to interact with um, if you need something delivered to your room and, and probably in other ways as well. Um, and uh, so with that, I'll stop and, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>